We were real savers. Um, and uh, obviously, in retrospect, knowing the whole you can't save yourself to wealth philosophy, but um, we really were savers. And I wasn't always like that. I grew up in a family with seven kids. Um, I was one of seven, middle child. And, um, you know, there, there was no there was no pocket money. There was no education on finances, really. You're listening to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard. Hello, and welcome to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard, where I get to speak to property investors from around Australia about their investing journey. My name is Karen Chavez, and I'm one of the coaches here with Positive Real Estate, where we help people build wealth through property. With over 8,000 clients across Australia and New Zealand, there are some incredible stories to tell, which hopefully make your investing journey that little bit easier and inspire you along the way. My guest today is the fabulous Holly, and we discuss the importance of living below your means, having a plan and not getting distracted by media noise, and don't do nothing. Keep asking questions and look for solutions to move forward. Enjoy this conversation with Holly. Hi, my name is Karen Chavez and I'm a property investment coach with Positive Real Estate. And today I'm hosting our Property Investment Tales podcast with our fabulous guest, Holly. Hi, Karen. Very happy to be here. Welcome along, Holly. I'm really looking forward to having a good chat with you today. Um, We'll, uh, we'll dive on in and obviously we'll get on with the with the interview. So Holly has been a client of ours for a couple of years now. It's gone so fast, hasn't it, Holly? Um, been no, racing. It's not even two years. Yeah, I know. And I think that's a really great uh, lead in to say maybe just tell us a bit about yourself and you know, a bit about you know, your, your background and because you've got a, quite an interesting story. Yeah. Um, it's not a really a real um, one size fits all story, I suppose. But uh, we are we we came here six years ago with our six month old baby um, to Australia um, through my husband's work and with the intention of staying here forever. Um, and uh, we obviously had the usual challenges that people that are foreign residents have with buying property, which is that the astronomical costs and um, yeah. Not just that, but the cost of living as well, a lot's higher. Um, so we had this kind of, we were in this kind of holding pattern, I suppose, while we waited for PR to happen before we could um, get going. Um, or that's what we thought anyway. Um, <laughs> I obviously realised that wasn't the case, um, having done some research and then finally uh, getting hold of you guys. Um, we managed to make a lot of stuff happen for us and we only recently got our PR um and a lot has happened in the last 18 months or so it's been a huge journey and you know just to sort of elaborate a little bit further you know the cost is I know when we looked into the cost of buying as a, a foreign investor which until you, you know, obviously in Australia until you get your your permanent residency you are classified as a, a foreign investor under a yeah. temporary, as a temporary resident and with that comes some some hefty uh cost and I know, you know, the surcharges, like each state's got their own you know, extra surcharges and taxes that they charge. And yeah. to be even able to sign a contract, you've got to have the Foreign Investor Review Board approval from the federal government. Like even just that alone, how much was that um, each time you did that? Uh, well, it doubled. So it was about six and a half grand, the first property. Yeah. Um, and the second property, it was 13. <laughs> I actually don't think I realised the second one was 13. I thought it was about 10 or 11. I had that in my head. So, wow. Yeah, that's, it was um, yeah it's very iffy. Tax, state and federal level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're getting um, taxed at, at, on both sides. Um, so maybe just tell us a little bit about what you did um, actually do then while you were still as a temporary resident. How did you sort of move forward and... Yeah, well, stuff work for yourselves. I guess I'll start the story by talking about our mindsets, I suppose, coming into mm -hmm. it because we were real savers. Um, yes. And uh, obviously, in retrospect, knowing the whole you can't save yourself to wealth philosophy, but um, we really were savers. And I wasn't always like that. I grew up in a family with seven kids. Um, I was one of seven, middle child. And um, 
you know, there, there was no, there was no pocket money. There was no education on finances really. Um, so when I did start working at 15, as soon as I could, I, I spent everything I earned. I just loved spending that money. Um, and when I met David, I was 27. And um, that's when I really realized, oh my goodness, I've been working for 12 years and I've got absolutely nothing to show for it. Some good times, obviously, but- um, Some good memories perhaps. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's the opposite. Like he was always very frugal and very mindful of um, the things himself and, um, and as a result of that, he bought, um, well, what's turned out to be our first investment property um, when we first started seeing it. Um, and I was, um, I went through this kind of moment in my life where I just thought, what am I doing? <laughs> um, and he said to me, um, one thing I've learned is that it's never too late to save. So that's what I started doing. And we started doing that together really um so we've always from that moment on lived below our means we've always um done a sort of semi-budget we've always made a single month um and we managed to buy our first house without selling the the, the apartment that he'd originally bought this is in london yeah um so without even thinking about it we became investors property investors um so this was nearly 10 years ago now um, so when we came, we had those two properties and then we sold our house, um, with a view to buying, and this is before we talked about the foreign investors charge and everything. Yeah. So, um, we had this cash now, um, put it across and we, I, it was burning a hole in my pocket, but not in a way that I wanted to spend it, you know, on cars and things, but I wanted to sell us up for the future. Um, so we started looking for a house and uh, this was in 2020 when the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the property prices were just like going out of control we just realized we we were out we were priced out of where we wanted to live um, and we weren't going to be able to save as fast as those prices were going up so there's something else that we needed to do so this is how I found you guys um, I started looking at investing um, rent vest possible strategies to help us get where we wanted to get to in life um yes. without you know throwing our hands up in the air and you know moving out west where we somewhere we didn't want to live or you know ending mm -hmm. up buying something that would be suitable by this point I should probably say I was pregnant with our third baby that's right when <laughs> I met you you were pregnant with your third yeah um and I did my research you know I I I attended god knows how many webinars um yours was one of them um and you guys were the ones that I, we landed on because um firstly you were actually creative you know you didn't hear that we didn't have PR and go oh, okay you're not for us you know that was the first thing um the second thing was um there were just so many options uh, the property circles somewhere to something to do with our cash while we were getting our things together um and also your creativity and in, in, talking about the house and land in Brisbane which is the first property um the fact that you know we didn't have to pay the surcharge on the build um it's a land only so it was reducing that foreign investor cost yeah um and obviously it was a good time to buy as well in the yeah. market yeah well and you know just to sort of elaborate a little bit there like we did do some research we looked at um you know, some different states and Victoria and Queensland and realised that Queensland, their surcharge wasn't as high as New South Wales and Victoria and just doing the, the land contract and then doing the build after settlement allowed you to just really reduce that surcharge. I think the surcharge ended up costing you about the same as if you'd bought a completed property in Victoria. So it was, it worked yeah. out really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. And also it was a good time in the market in Brisbane. It was slightly behind that's right. Um, New South Wales and Victoria. So in, in terms of the, the clock. So I think already we kind of made it well, in theory, made our money back um, oh, from those extra charges, like within a few months. Absolutely. Like that, that part of the Brisbane market has just been phenomenal. I think, yeah. you know, pro property prices in that area, what they're kind of going for now is they're probably 150 to $200,000 more than what you've paid, which is just amazing. Um, and then we also did a, 
a bit more now I think you came back and said oh look you know feeling a bit like we're, we're a bit stuck now we've got the first property and PR is nowhere near we've got no idea how that's going to when that's going to land yeah <laughs> which was quite interesting <laughs> well I think um so that all happened so we we put some money in a couple of property circles yes and we bought that house and land that was all in sort of 2022 um, and then Christmas happened and David and I had some chats about what we wanted to do because rent vesting is not for the faint hearted. You know, it's kind of a strategy you need to stick with. Yes. Um, and we just thought, do want our own home <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, so I remembered, I think I booked one of the first meetings when you were back from holiday from that Christmas yes. break. And I was like, OK, strategy. Um, we're going to want that home at some point in the future. Um and so I think it just gave me even more of a push to really just keep things going um, and just get our money working for us so that we could have that cash in, let's say, eight, 10 years time, whatever is a good time to buy, to get that property that we want where we want it. Um, and then that's when you said, oh, um, <laughs> ACT might be a good option. Yeah, we realised, we did a bit more research, and ACT doesn't have a foreign investor surcharge. They just charge a very small extra bit of land tax until you're a permanent resident, and then that disappears again. So we went, okay, ACT is the place to go. We can really reduce the, the cost of entry here with, um, as a foreign investor. And I think you'd signed the contract for that, and maybe like literally a few weeks later, PR landed. <laughs> yes, paid yeah. that FIRB. Um, but no, it was, it's uh, very excited about that property too. Yeah, yeah. And look, and since you did that, entered that contract, I know that those prices for that property have already gone up more than what the um, the foreign investor okay. surcharge was. So you sort of already got that money back. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the PR came through surprisingly fast in the end um which was um, yeah it took about eight months for it, which I think is quite standard but the thing about that is that you just never know you just get a phone call one day to say it's happened yes. <laughs> so it's wait 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 and then it's happened so that was a real fist pump moment for us yeah yeah absolutely um see so you and David have got quite a history of um you know property ownership and some investments and you've still got one of your properties in London I know that um as well that's giving you some cash flow coming through from there which is great um tell me something what do your friends and family think about what you're doing at the moment uh I'm quite selective about who I yeah. talk to about it I think um, I think a good way of looking at it is it's like any other job. Yes. Some people want to hear about it and some people don't. So yeah. I, I think my, my dad asks questions about it and I, I talk to him about it. Um, and I've got a few friends who are really interested. Um, they have their own investments and, and they, they want to know how I'm doing. And, and it's, a, it's a sign that people are good friends when they celebrate things that you're doing and so I, I I talk to those people about it but it's not something I'm going to be showing from the rooftops to people it's, it's it's an interesting concept isn't it people just look at you like you've got a second head when you start talking about investing and I'm the same it's even with the role I've got people don't and people know what I do it's just not conversations that, that we have with people out there so you know for you like the importance then and I think you realize this early on of you know getting getting that support along the way um so if we sort of circle back around a little bit to you know just getting started yeah what do you feel kind of was the lessons that you've learned along the way so far and um what's been some of the the things going forward that you might even do a little bit differently um I think our, in our specific case, we were we were in this position in the first place because we lived below our means. I think that first and foremost is the the key thing, the key message. Um, there are a few, but that's that's a big one because it gives you the options and it gives you the choices to turn that 
savings into something better. Um, so that's the first thing. That's the first lesson. I'm really happy that I started doing that, albeit you know later than other people, but perhaps before other people. Um, second thing is that you always other ways of doing things and you need to just do something don't do nothing um we could have just sat with our bank account losing value for the last couple of years um but instead we've made we built we've started building our wealth and we've done a you know we've done the best we could with what we had um so that would be my message to people um it would be to don't do nothing just get started and like I said about you know after Christmas we did some really deep thinking the two of us and decided you know this is what we want in our future and then we you know sometimes you have to change that strategy a bit and you have to tweak things here and there and that's what we're going to probably continue to do um but we've got that foundation and we've got that mm -hmm. we've, we've started and that's the thing and um keep it going you know commit to it and yeah. and keep it going I love the um, Jason's morning coffee chats I watch them every day never at the time he does them never live it's always <laughs> it's always later that day yeah. but they really um they keep you going they keep you committed to that strategy um and I think it's just that dopaminergic effect of you know having those people that community of people who all go through the same thing and like you were saying, you know, you, you can't always talk to your dearest, uh, nearest and dearest about it. Mm -hmm. um, but having that community is really good. And I listen to Sam's podcast. I obviously listen to the Investor Tales podcast. And it's, um, and it's just, a con just a constant energizer for this very, very long-term strategy, which ultimately is like three decades. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and I know you're very committed to um, you know, regular meetings, even with myself as your mentor and coach. And you know, it's uh, I know some clients kind of wait for me to reach out and say, "Hey, let's catch up." I haven't seen for, but you're very regular with um, checking in and um, just keeping. You know, sometimes our meetings are just like really quick, and other times we spend a bit more time in detail. And it's just that keep things moving, and it's like steering a ship. I say to people, you know. Kind of set it on a course but if you just leave it it's going to drift with the current you've got to actually stay on it and keep adjusting it as you go to keep focused on your destination which you're doing really really yeah well. absolutely I think a lot of it is about focus because having that conversation with you going through the spreadsheet with you it could be 10 minutes but that is enough to keep me going for the next month keep my focus Yes. stop me going out and buying those coffees and those croissants and the things that I don't need in my life you know yeah. um and just keep me you know you you're, you've got this kind of I hope you don't take offense at this no. uh, but that your kind of steady hand on the tiller vibe um is a good foil for my sometimes you know like to jump in and, and do this thing and do that thing um so it's good to come back to you you have a reality check sometimes and also your knowledge of property investing is much bigger than mine because you've been doing a lot longer so it's good to have that um oh but you could do it this way oh this is a better way of doing it you know getting somebody with the experience to um to really give you good advice something you know is good advice um rather than listening to the clickbait mainstream media <laughs> oh no there's so much catastrophizing that stuff yeah yeah, I do like to look outside of PRE, but actually it's it's a really useful thing for me. It has been useful um, to sort of stress test the thing, the strategy. Yes. Um, and occasionally I found some clickbait article about how, oh, investors are doing really badly and they shouldn't have heard in the last 10 years. And then I occasionally will, I posted one to the group um, and Sam uh, responded quite quickly basically saying this is complete rubbish you know so it's good to you know test other things I also listened to another podcast saying don't buy new don't buy new property it's a bad investment and I thought oh my god <laughs> and then uh, the caveat was unless it's you know um, a good ratio of land value to property value unless they've got the infrastructure unless it's um, you know in high demand and you know all of that stuff and I think okay tick 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 that's fine yeah. so it just 
it keeps you focused it keeps you energized and motivated to achieve those goals yeah and a lot of people just hear the headline don't buy new in that example and they'd be like oh don't buy new property but they wouldn't take the time to actually go into the detail and get the unless it's this 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 so yes yeah um, part of what we teach is really that process of don't just take the surface actually understand what's going on and why and yeah take that next yeah step. I mean the educational aspect of I mean, I've learned so, hundreds of hours of learning I've had um I might yeah. as well have done a degree in it I think um it's been that in you know intense for me because I I get quite obsessed with stuff and I enjoy it so I'm constantly um on realestate.com I'm constantly <laughs> listening to the podcast I'm constantly you know trying to fill my mind with information and that helps as well to keep you motivated and to keep you um to give you the confidence to make those big decisions and they are big decisions yeah they are absolutely um you know you're, you're investing in your future and yeah. it, the more like you, you really can't do enough to to set yourself up for that to to get the outcome that you're after yes yeah. Something that you said that I'd like to circle back on, which is really interesting, and it's, it's a bit of a left of field question. Um, so, now you mentioned it, that you're one of seven children and grew up without, you know, any any real. Um, you know, your parents didn't teach you about money. There was no pocket money, and you grew up without kind of having that savings concept. How are you different with your children? Uh, well, my oldest is quite young still, so their <laughs> financial education hasn't really begun yet um apart from that we you know they've lost a couple of teeth <laughs> <laughs> um but I know how I will be different and that's um well my aim is to I, we live in a very privileged area um and there's a lot of wealth surrounding us we live in Mossman um and this is where why we've chosen to rent rest because we could not buy a five million dollar house unfortunately mm -hmm. um so <clears throat> our kids are surrounded by wealth surrounded by children who have lots of stuff um and they're surrounded by children who don't who get given stuff uh, and and it's going to be very difficult I know in the future you know um teaching them and making sure that they're experiencing that delayed gratification side of things to make them value the things that they have in life um, so I think the, the, the Barefoot Investor for Families book has been quite useful. I'll probably start um, applying some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, I think I, I'm, I'm just going to be talking about money around the dinner table, unlike what happened in our house. There was never discussions about money. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully just being open and open about things and just making sure that they're not too spoiled. <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah all right so and also the you know that the um the membership with pre obviously yes it's it, passed down to the kids so yeah, um, i think that's an awesome legacy i'll be encouraging them in that direction yeah i've got clients who have children in their sort of teens and even like you know sort of early 20s and they'll be watching mentoring workshops on the tv in the lounge room together as a family and things like that so um awesome. which i think is really really cool um so i'm gonna sort of just to sort of wrap up a little bit um what would you if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be the one piece of advice you would give yourself Oh, I'm going to be so boring and say, <laughs> start oh. sooner. <laughs> yeah, definitely start earlier. You know, yeah. we'd, we'd, um, you know, we'd just be further on in our journey. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it though. I, I have no regrets. I, I think we've managed to get ourselves into a good position um, just by being sensible with our money so far. Yeah. Um, and now that and by taking that leap when the opportunity came so uh that's what i would say to my younger self who didn't know any better who didn't have any education on this um get some education yeah absolutely. you know when you met david and you sort of 
went from being the spender to suddenly seeing what David was doing as a saver. Mm-hmm. Was that a hard shift for you to actually make or is it a, a light bulb moment going, oh, my God? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't hard because um, I wanted those children and that life and I knew that that's the way I was going to get it. I suppose it's a, it's just a mindset shift because, you know, we're conditioned in life to value stuff, mm. you know, the, the material thing. And we know that it doesn't bring us happiness, but this is what's being so, and I work in marketing. So, you know, I, <laughs> I can see it all around. They're, they're not selling things, they're selling happiness. And we know that that's not the reality. So when you take those things away, you're still just as happy as you were. Um, but you've got a future ahead of you and you've got possibilities and options and choices ahead of you that you didn't have before. So it wasn't hard at all. Um, there are things that we need to do, like going and seeing family, that stuff costs a lot of money and that's worth the spend. But buying a, buying like a handbag is not, is no. not something that I care about. That has been a mindset shift. And it's, it's a new type of conditioning for me. That's awesome. That's really good. Fantastic. Well, Holly, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today. Any, any parting words of wisdom for our listeners um, that you'd like to share? Um, uh, don't reach out to the team, have conversations, do some learning, get going. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to our next strategy meeting, which won't be too far away. I know that. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure chatting with you. Hey, thanks for listening to Property Investor Tales. Remember to subscribe so you get notified every time a new episode drops. As you can guess, I love hearing people's property investor tales. So if you'd like to share yours, then please get in touch with me via email at propertyinvestortales at positivementor.com.au. We would also love your feedback and I would appreciate a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Remember, you can watch all of these podcasts over on YouTube at Positive Mentor or at positivementor.com.au. Until then, take care, happy investing, and bye for now.